Hey everybody, and welcome to my first Star Wars review. My passion for this fandom could not keep me away from every film, regardless of my opinion of each individual film, and I'm excited to get into this and share my love for the universe that George Lucas has created. As we go on our journey into a galaxy far, far away, we will start with the first film of the prequel trilogy. So let's travel back to a time where a Star Wars film had not been released in over 15 years, and George Lucas had finally decided that film technology had progressed far enough to where he wanted to tell more stories in that universe. So in 1999, Episode One: The Phantom Menace released in the theaters. Now, I was only about three at the time, so I wasn't going to see it for about another year, and my family w wanted to make sure that I had seen the original trilogy beforehand. The Phantom Menace is set just over 30 years before A New Hope, and follows the story of two Jedi Knights, Qui-Gon Jinn and his apprentice Obi-Wan Kenobi. They've been tasked with protecting Queen Amidala, the leader of the planet Naboo, while she's attempting to bring a peaceful end to a planet-wide blockade that's been brought up by an interplanetary trade dispute. Along the way, they meet a young slave named Anakin Skywalker, who is unusually strong in the Force, and around that same time, the Jedi must contend with the mysterious return of the Sith Order. With an all-star cast at Lucas's disposal, you would think that the performances would be more memorable. I mean, look at it this way. Natalie Portman, Liam Neeson, Ewan McGregor, these are all great actors. But they were given, well, how do I put this without being rude? Or... I'm just gonna go ahead and say it. They were given, well, shit to work with. Bad direction and dialogue makes this hard to actually criticize individual performances because throughout the movie pretty much every single performance is very monotone and wooden and there's only one or two off the top of my head that I can think of that weren't wooden or monotone for good or bad reasons and that's Ian McDermott as Chancellor Palpatine aka the future Emperor of the Imperial Empire and Jar Jar Binks. I'm going to start with the positive one first. First of all, Ian McDermott can never do any wrong. He's able to take anything that he's given and make it good, whether it's good or bad. And he's very compelling to watch. He is indeed a high caliber actor. Then on the other side of the spectrum, you have, um, I don't remember what his name was. I think it was like Ahmed Best. He played uh, Jar Jar Binks. Nothing against the actor. He, he just did what he was uh, told to do, but... I'm just gonna get into it. I hate Jar Jar. He is overly eccentric for the wrong reasons, he is useless to the plot, and he's goofy in an unfunny way. The film did not need him, period. I will give a slight nod to Ewan McGregor as Obi-Wan Kenobi. He didn't get as much screen time compared to the other characters, but whenever he was on screen I did enjoy him. I didn't enjoy him as much as I would down the line, but... I still have to give a nod to that. I did think that he did a, a good job, at least. When this film came out, it was a technical and visual masterpiece, a marvel of computer-generated imagery technology, and that was because CGI to that extent had never been done before. It was mainly used for very small visual effects in movies, and maybe, for an example, monsters in B-rate movies. But at this point, George Lucas wanted to solely rely on CGI and use little to no practical effects. The only practical effects that I can think of were the pods and the pod racing. Those were actually real. But as I said, Lucas decided to rely mostly on CGI. And for a film, when you use very little to no practical effects, if they're just not used at all, then as the years go by, the film starts to look a little worse. For example, this film has not aged at all. The CGI is extremely dated. And in a film where you can tell that every background and scene is fake, you lose a certain emotional connection to the film. Especially if you can tell that the characters aren't even connected to their environment in any sense. The world stunts and effects give any film an authentic and tangible sense of humanity. Without that, how can I feel any shred of humanity in a film that relies heavily on CGI and has little to no practical effects? Now, of course, there are exceptions. Uh, for example, this year, during the Oscars, 
Jungle Book won for best visual effects. And the reason why it did was because that that entire film was completely CGI. The only thing that was real in there was the little boy who played Mowgli. Now keep in mind, that technology it took over a decade to be developed so that they could accomplish that level of CGI. But that's a that's a discussion slash video slash whatever for another time. Slash etc. Thank you. <laughs> do you want to do the review? <laughs> I don't know. I think I memorized your script pretty well. I think I can do it. <laughs> but I'm getting off track. Um, one of the one of the redeeming qualities in this film, I wouldn't necessarily consider it a redeeming quality because I only like it because it just looks cool and I have fun with it, are the lightsaber battles. For the original trilogy, the battles weren't very extravagant, the lightsaber battles that is, but it was the interest, connection, and love for the characters that made the fights more compelling. And also the fights helped to drive character development and even reinforce the themes of what was going on in the scene and even the overarching story of the film or the trilogy. While it can be showcased in just simple battles and actions, this film does not execute it properly. For instance, Qui-Gon and Maul were obviously not in the original trilogy, so it was obvious that one of them or even both of them were going to die. That and the Jedi up to the point at the end of the battle, they've had little to no interaction with Maul. So, there's no weight to the proceedings, no stakes on who will win, and no character being reinforced while they're fighting. Of course, it's normally seen as the best of the lightsaber battles in the prequels, but I think that that's due to Maul's voiceless and striking presence. I will admit that while I am bashing on this lightsaber fight, I do still consider this one of the redeeming qualities in the entire film, and it is something that I will always go back and look forward to whenever I rewatch this movie. The last redeeming quality I have in this film, which I'll have with pretty much every episodic Star Wars film, is the score composed by John Williams. I do feel that this particular soundtrack is inferior to a few of the other movies, but it's still damn great. The highlight of this soundtrack is Duel of the Fates, which is the ridiculously epic track that plays while Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon Jinn are having their duel with Maul. The use of choral music is a stroke of William's genius. To recap, this is one of the worst Star Wars movies ever made, but in my opinion, it's not the absolute worst. I can still have fun with it, as long as I fast forward through about 93% of the film. I wouldn't usually suggest this movie to anybody, but since it is part of Star Wars canon, if you're a completionist like me, you have to watch it. It's just as simple as that. And as I said, there are many, many flaws to this film, but there are the two redeeming qualities, which, as I said, were the lightsaber battle and the musical score. Anyway, guys, that's all I have time for. Please tune in next time for my next Star Wars review, which will be Attack of the Clones. Uh... Please subscribe to the channel for more movie reviews because helping to support this channel will help me to make more videos more often. What, what are you doing? What are you doing? I'm already subscribed, so I don't know what to do in this case if I'm, I already am subscribed. Will you, I, I'm already will doing you the go? thing. I mean, like, it's fine. I love you, but Jesus! For any of you who don't know, that is Mallory. That's my girlfriend and assistant editor slash director. And she's back. <clears throat> hey, you're talking about me. I might as well be in the frame. I guess. I, I don't know how to get out of this. This was the beginning of our downfall. Uh huh. When he literally cut me out of every frame, get it, of his life. Okay, thank you guys so much for watching. <laughs> I'll see you later. Bye.